Hebrews 4.12. Ready? Begin. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a deserter of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So our lesson for today is a continuation of our lesson concerning the scriptures. Amen? Amen. We're done with uh, the canon of scriptures. We're done with the authority of the Bible. And some uh, deeper study we have every Tuesday. Okay? So I hope if you have time every Tuesday night, attend our Bible school. Amen? Right now, our lesson is about the proofs that the Bible is the Word of God. Of course, we know that the Bible claims itself to be the Word of God. Amen, Sister Reds. Good morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ano? Magaling na po Sister Reds na kasama natin ngayon. So, before I preach something about the weakness of proofs, that means the judge should live by his faith. Alam po natin, we know that the Bible is uh, filled with facts and scientific truths and yet because of because of uh, this corrupt mind this won't really believe all of this okay despite of the proofs man will still doubt God and there are still people who do not believe God okay that's why the judge should live by his faith but on the other side we know also that Christian faith it's not a foolish faith. It is a rational faith. This faith is depending on the truth, who is God Himself. That means facts will prove it. Like it's po ibig sabihin. Iba yung nananampalataya, nananampalataya na parang, ay, if you are watching some videos, just sa Facebook at sa social media, you will find this martial arts na yung ginanon lang, gusto mong ba? Yung, di ba? Yung, yung hindi na, they're not touching. Baka tas bigla na lang, ano, bigla na lang iikot, gugulong yung mga tao. And they believe that it's true. But when it is, tapos when, when that martial artist, that's, that supernatural martial artist, fought with a real martial artist, eh talagang bugbog sarado. Talagang pasapasa yung mukha niya. Kasi fake, you see? They are believing in something that is foolish. So, Kasi dapat, if it's true, then it must have science. Nagis yung po? Meron dapat katotohanan. There are really facts that should support it. And that's what the Bible is. The Bible is truth. And yes, we have to believe it by faith. But because it is true, once you have to, once you study it, once you find it on science, it you will receive facts beyond measure. Kasi, Tinuturo ng Bible, lugar, history. Are you with me? Amen. That means there is a science that can check if it's real or not. That's why there is archaeology and there are written uh, historical documents that you can find. Because if you would read, just for example, the book of Kings. If you would read the book of Kings in the Bible, these books mention kings of other lands. Okay? So, syempre, meron namang history to study it. So, just for example, there is a king of Assyria named Shalmaneser. That, is a, that, that, that was written in the Bible. And so, there should be books that supports that, that Assyria had really a king named Shalmaneser. And if, and if you find their archaeology, they found it out. It's real. So, that it gets you po ibig sabihin. So, because the Bible is true, once you use science, you find out that it's really, really true. Amen? And so that will be our uh, lesson. What's the difference of this book among all books? What's the difference of the Bible? The Bible is a supernatural book. The verse that we have read a while ago says, For the Word of God is quick. It doesn't mean fast. Quick means alive. The Word of God is a living Word. The Bible is true. It is the Word of God. And that means it is alive and it's doing something and it's working. And so we will study today the supernatural elements of the Bible. The first one that we will see is that it's amazing unity. 
the amazing unity of the Bible. That the Bible is a unity is a fact no honest reader can deny. If you don't know, your Bible is composed of 66 books. Hello? Yeah. This one book is composed of 66 books. It was not written on one time. Later, we will study that. In the preface of all of most Bibles, the 39 Old Testament and 27 New Testament books are listed in two parallel columns down the entire 66 uh, down the entire page. But a more accurate way would be to place the entire 66 collection in a clock-like circle, with Genesis occupying the first minute past 12, Exodus the second. Kasi ang ganda no, in, in Genesis you find the beginning, and in Revelation you find the last of the days. So makikita po natin yan, and you you would really see how united it was, and how it ended telling the future, how it began telling the beginnings of all things. And in the midst of it, you find the history of mankind, you find God's dealing to His people, and you find one God leading the people who believe Him. Okay? So, napakaganda po ng unity ng Bible. This 66 books is a united book. Speaks of the same God. This unity is achieved in spite of the long period of time involved in its writing. That's, that's letter A. This unity is achieved in spite of the long period involved in its writing. More than 15 centuries elapsed between the writing of Genesis and Revelation. The first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible had this gap of 1,500 years. You see? So, upon the writing of Genesis, and upon the upon the ending of Revelation, how come the how can it be united? Just like to imagine what if we will write a book right now and then somebody would write with the same topic after maybe 20 years. And it really be different. Just 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 even the accounting books. Are you with me? Alam niyo yung mga accounting books, those that are taking board exams. Ten years ago, my wife, my wife had this review of accounting. Iba na ngayon yung nire-review. It's a different book right now. Every year they change a book. Why? Hindi magpagkaisa. Laging may bago na obsolete yung iba. Just two years, three years, five years, ten years. There is, there is a, there is a library in, uh, ano pinakamalaking library sa mundo? I forgot. Maybe it's in France. And it's filled with obsolete books. There is a part of that that is filled with obsolete books. Books that are outdated. And my 1500 years, yung Genesis at saka yung Revelation, halos isa pa rin ang sinusulat. Pointing to the same God and His plan of salvation to mankind. Nearly 400 years elapsed between the last Old Testament books and the New Testament first book, Matthew. We're not talking about decades, we're talking about millennium, millennial, thousands of years, hundreds of years. That's how united the Bible is. That's how that's how supernatural the Bible is. Okay? Letter B. This unity is achieved in spite of the many authors, some 40 writers or authors, and their various occupations. Are you with me now? Listen, if a policeman will write something about a church, and then a baker will write something about the church, it will be hard to unite them. Are you with me? Hello? But here you can find different authors from different ages, from different span of time, and different occupations. Moses was an Egyptian king. Joshua was a soldier. Samuel was a priest. David was a king and shepherd. Esther was a queen. Ruth, a housewife. Joe was a rich farmer. Amos was a poor farmer. Ezra, a scribe. Isaiah, prophet. Daniel, prime minister. Nehemiah, cupbearer. 
Matthew, tax collector, Mark, an evangelist, Luke, a doctor, John, a wealthy fisherman, Peter was a poor fisherman, Jude and James probably were carpenters, and Paul was a tent maker and a lawyer. So different occupations, different classes, may class A, may class B, may class C, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, financial status. And yet you find they have created one united book because we believe that they are just human instrument and there is only one author, which is the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. Next one. This unity is achieved in spite of the geographical places where the Bible was written. Some were written in the desert. Some on Mount Sinai. Some in Egypt. Probably Jeremiah's book was written in Egypt. So we're talking about the places where some books were written. John, where did John wrote the book of Revelation? Ephesus. Sure. No, no, I will not know. Trust the teacher, okay? <laughs> and then, so good, we, we can talk about that, okay? But but the revelation was given in the Isle of Patmos. That's good, okay? John had the revelation in the Isle of Patmos. And according to our evangelist, it was written at Ephesus. Okay? We will study that. And that's good. Amen? And then next is, Daniel wrote the books in Babylon. And Esther in Persia. And and first and, and and first and second Thessalonians in Corinth. Some are written inside prison cells. You see? So the books that were written were written in different places. Amen. Just try to imagine. One book will be written in China and another book will be written in the Philippines and another book will be written in Thailand. How can you unite it? Just try to imagine. Even the language is so different. And and the culture is so different. How can, how can the book that was written in the time of, 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 of Exodus, where Egypt was the world power, would be united with a book that was written in the time of Persian government, okay? Which the culture is different. And then here comes the time of the Roman Empire. Then the, the, the books were written. The culture was different. The nationality of the two, of, of the authors are different. How can it become one book? I cannot imagine. How can it be? Without God moving on this, uh, on this uh, blessed book, the Word of God. Amen? Amen? So, it's unity achieved in spite of the different geographical places where the Bible was written. Another... This unity is achieved. Look, ah, hindi lang. So, just try to imagine. We're, we're talking about things that is hard, that are hard to be united. And yet, in the Bible, you find one book in spite of the, the places it was written, uh, the, the authors who wrote it, and, and, and the time period. And then next, next one is the styles. The styles. Some are historical books. From Joshua to to uh, Esther, you find books that are narrative. It's history, and then you will find prophetic books, and you will find poetic books, books that are songs and poems. Some are autobiography, some are poetry, some are law. The Book of Romans is as if it is a law book, and then ah. Uh, some are love letters, letters of Paul to the churches. Some are in proverb form. Iba iba ho. Okay? These are different styles of writing and writers. And how would you unite a song with a narrative and a narrative to a letter? But when you read the Bible, you are reading a book which is from God. You know it. When you read the book of Psalms, you know that God is talking to you. When you read the book of Hebrews, you know God is talking. You, when you read the, the, the letters of Paul, you know God is talking. When you read Genesis to, 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 to uh, uh, Deuteronomy, you know God is talking. Sabi niya dito, let us see this example and may I read it carefully. Daughter said, let us imagine a religious novel of 66 chapters. 
which was begun by a single writer around 6th century AD. It's an illustration, okay? After the author has completed but five chapters, he suddenly died. But during the next 1,000 years, up to the 16th century, around 30 amateur freelance writers feel religious and feel constrained to contribute to this unfinished religious novel. Few of these authors share anything in common. They speak different languages, live at different times in different countries, have totally different backgrounds and occupations, and write in different styles. <laughs> Ang gulunong, can you imagine? 1,500 years, as ibang lahi, iba na yung, iba na yung dimension ng na, 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 na papaligiri na nila, nakapaligid sa kanila. How can you create one novel book that will be united? My, but that's the Bible. After, after Deuteronomy, another one wrote, and another one wrote, then a fisherman wrote. Are you with me? And then, and then uh, a scribe uh, wrote. But all of it, once you read it, it is one united book. That is the unity of the Bible. Despite of the, in spite of the styles of writing, you find one united book, and we call it the Word of God. The supernatural unity of this blessed book. 66 books. Even right now, find, find 66 books that is written in 2013. And the subject is all about love. You can never unite them. If the authors are different, the authors have different view about love. You can never unite it as one book. Even just one year. But this is thousands of years, hundreds of years. Different author, different countries, different style. United as one book. It is supernatural because of its unity. Second thing, the supernatural element, number two, is its indestructibility. The book that has been trying to be destroyed for so many times is still existing after centuries of persecutions. Are you with me? And the persecutors are not just some men. The persecutors are the most powerful men of history. Uh -huh. Let us read some. Para, there is an illustration here that it's like a smith. Alam yung panday, di ba? And, and once you go to that smith's house, you will find some destroyed hammer and still the anvil, yung anvil yung paluan, still strong. Sira na lahat ng hammer. Ang pinapalitan yung hammer, hindi yung anvil. Di ba usually nasisira yung paluan? Ganun ang Bible eh. Despite of all the persecutions, the persecutors just died. The persecutions just ended. And still we have the Bible available for everybody. You see? So that's how indestructible the Bible is. So it is with the Word of God. The hammers of persecution, ridicule, higher criticism, liberalism, atheism have for centuries pounded out their vicious blows upon the divine anvil, which is the word, but all to no avail. There they lie in rusting piles while the mighty anvil of the scripture stands unbroken, unshaken, and unchipped. Perfectly preserved. Amen? Amen. It's indestructibility in spite of political persecution. What are the persecutions that the Bible faced throughout the centuries? Political persecutions from the Roman emperors. Listen. In AD 303, Emperor Diocletian thought he had destroyed every hated Bible. After many tireless years of ruthless slaughter and destruction, he erected a column of victory over the embers of a burned Bible. The title on the column read, Extinct is the name of Christian. Twenty years later, the new emperor Constantine offered a reward for any remaining Bibles. Within 24 hours, no less than 50 copies were brought out of hiding and presented to the king. Can you imagine that? 
after many years of doing his thing as a, you know what's an emperor of Rome the king of the whole world that time the emperor of Rome is the king of the Roman Empire the largest empire ever built he tried everything to destroy Christianity and the Bible and just finding out after his death there was another king who tried to fight and there are many copies that were hidden you see it is indestructible it's indestructibility in spite of religious persecutions. As seen to the persecution by Roman Catholic popes. Almost without exception, the early popes opposed the reading and translating of the Bible. In 1199, Pope Innocent III ordered the burning of all Bibles. 1199, Pope Innocent III ordered the burning of all Bibles. You can find also in the persecutions leveled against John Wycliffe and William Tyndale. We don't have much time to study their lives. So, but, but you would find these people, the this translator, because before, the Bible is not available for the laity. The clergy are the priests. The laity are the people, right? So, only the, only the clergy can have the books. And, and, and it's only in Latin. So it can never be translated. So how the people would understand it? And here, there are some people who have this heart that, 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 that is God-given to, to, to make the Bible available for the common people. So that the people can read in the palm of their hands the Word of God. And may I tell you, the persecution was great. William Tyndale was burned at the stake. John Wycliffe, though he died by paralysis, even his books were dead just to burn it. Just, can you imagine how cruel and how uh, dedicated uh, the, this uh, uh, Inquisition period was to destroy these translators? Pero mga kapatid, wala. Na-translate pa rin ang Bible sa English. Amen? And then next, it's indestructibility in spite of philosophical persecution. I like this. Because there are so many intelligent people in the world. Just even just recently, I, I was watching these debates. Maybe you heard it. I forgot his name. But he's always debating against uh, theism, against people who believe God. He is an atheist who just died of cancer, and he died with no God. And 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 and, and, you, and you can find throughout centuries bright people who think you know they can destroy this faith of God's people towards Him and His Word. The first is Voltaire. He once said, pakinggan niyo po, Voltaire is a French uh, uh, philosopher and he once said, another century and there will be not a Bible on the earth. You can research him, we don't have much time to study his life, but you can check it on Google. Who is Voltaire? The century is gone. Sabi niya, after 100 years, para sa mga kanina, hindi nakarinig. Sabi ni Voltaire, pagkatapos ng isang daang taon, wala ng Bible. It will be updated. It will be gone. Natapos na yung isang daang taon, and the circulation of the Bible is one of the marvels of the age. After he died, his old printing press and the very house where he lived was purchased by Geneva Bible Society and made a depot for Bibles. You see? His, I didn't know that. I thought it was just his house. But according to this writer, even his own printing press was used to, promote, to produce Bibles. On December 24, 1933, the British government bought the valuable Codex Sinaiticus from the Russians for half a million dollars. On that same day, a first edition of Voltaire's work sold for 11 cents in Paris. <laughs> you see? Next, Thomas Paine. He once said, I have gone through the Bible as a man would go through a forest with an axe to fell trees. I have cut down tree after tree. Here they lie. They will never grow again. Tom Paine thought he had demolished the Bible, but since he crawled into a drunkard's grave in 1809, the Bible has leaped forward as never before. You see this man? Joseph Stalin. You know Joseph Stalin? This bloody butcher took over all Russia at the death of Lenin in the late 20s. 
From this point on until his death in the 50s, Stalin instituted a ban the Bible purge from the USSR, such as had never been witnessed before. This miserable man literally attempted to wipe the word of God and the God of the word from the Russian minds. Did he succeed? A recent poll taken in Russia shows that today, more people than ever believe in God and His Word. Uh -huh. It is so indestructible despite of persecution. Okay? Just even today, sometimes we wonder how would be the people of North Korea and Iran. Just last time, there was a speaker who spoke to us about what's happening in Iran and in Iraq. And in North Korea, how do they get the Bible? Why I tell you, technologies have reached them. Despite of the ban of the social media, radio stations are there. And the people of, the, of those places can hear the word of God being preached. There are testimonies of faith all around Iraq, all around Iran, all around North Korea. Persecutions are there. There are people who are beheaded. There are people who are burned. There are people who are in prison. And yet the Bible stands. Amen? The Bible stands. Third supernatural element. We will close our Sunday school with this. Third supernatural element. It's historical accuracy. Kanina, unity. Second, yung uh, uh, destruction, yung persecution. And then third, yung kanyang historical accuracy. Less than a century ago, the agnostic took great glee in sneeringly referring to the hundreds of historical mistakes of the Bible. But then came the science of archaeology, and with each shovel full of dirt, the sneers have become less visible until today they scarcely can be seen. When one thinks of historical scholarship in the Bible, three brilliant scholars come to mind. Come to mind. Just see the historical accuracy. There are some places in the Bible na nung before, na hindi pa advanced ang technology, sabi nila katang isip lang. Fictional lang yan. I remember there was a time when, when, when people believed that Shushan, the palace, is not existing. It is the palace of the Persian government in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. And so they thought, it's, wala namang Shushan, the palace. There are palaces all around the Persian Empire, but no Shushan, the palace. Until modern archaeology came and they dig and they dig and they dig and they found out it's real. On the very exact place as what the Bible is telling us. Andun yung lugar, yung ore of the Chaldees. Because do you remember when Abraham was commanded by the Lord? And, 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 and you would find that, how would, why will Abraham leave that? Akala lang natin, madali lang, pinaalis lang naman siya ng Diyos. But because of archaeology, it was found out that Ur was the New York of Abraham's time. The most advanced city in Abraham's time. Abraham was living in the prime city of the world in his time. And God telling him, go live it. And go to a place where I will prepare for you. What would that I will prepare for you? At ngayon pinag-aaralan namin, I am teaching ancient civilization. I was teaching ancient civilization. Why? All the facts are now given. Archaeologists have dig Ur of the Chaldees in Mesopotamia. In Iraq, and you can find the, 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 the reality of Abraham's words, the, the reality of the Bible. Dahil sa archaeology. And now, let us study these three men. Three brilliant scholars. First, before we end, Sir William Ramsey. Pakinggan niyo po ha. For many years, Ramsey was professor of humanity at the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Pala ko sa Aberdeen Court. Sa Scotland. Okay? He was in his time the world's most eminent authority on the geography and history of ancient Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. In his zeal to study every available early document concerning that period and area, he undertook an extensive research of the New Testament book of Acts and also the Gospel of Luke. This study, however, was approached with much skepticism. At that time, he penned the following description of the book of Acts. 
a highly imaginative and carefully colored account of primitive Christianity. But after many years of intensive study, this scholar who began an unbeliever became a staunch defender of the Word of God. The absolute historical accuracy of Luke's writings, even in the most minute details, captured first his brain and then his heart. Ramsey authored many books, but one of his better known is entitled, The Bearing of Recent Discovery on the Trustworthiness of the New Testament. An unbeliever who, who thought that the book of Acts is an imaginary book, a fictional book of Christianity. But because he was bright and he has the resources, he tried to dig and to study and to study until finding out all of the written record of Acts are accurate, are facts. Totoo yung mga lugar, totoo yung mga nangyari, totoo si Luke, totoo si Theophilus. Amen? Amen. And he wrote a book and he became a Christian. And let us, may I quote his uh, words. I take the view that Luke's history is unsurpassed in regard to its trustworthiness. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians. And they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. That's how perfectly factual the book of Luke and Acts were or are. Amen? Another one is William Albright. See, William Albright Lamani is the great, one of the greatest and most respected Oriental scholars who ever lived. He writes the following concerning the Bible and his historical findings. And I quote, The reader may rest assured, nothing has been found to disturb a reasonable faith. That's what I'm telling you. Our faith is a rational faith. Uh -huh. And nothing has been discovered which can disprove a single theological doctrine. We no longer trouble ourselves with attempts to harmonize religion and science. Or to prove the Bible. Because the Bible can stand for itself. Okay? And last is Robert Dick Wilson. We studied this, right? Robert Dick Wilson. Sino si Robert Dick Wilson? Robert Dick Wilson probably is the most qualified Old Testament linguist of all time. He was born in 1856. And took his undergraduate work at Princeton University. Graduating in 1876. Listen. He then completed both MA and the PhD. After this, he spent two years at the University of Berlin in further postgraduate studies. Wilson taught Old Testament courses at Western Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh and returned to Princeton where he received international fame as a Hebrew scholar without peer. Listen, he was perfectly at home in over 40 ancient Semitic languages. Dr. Wilson writes the following about himself. Listen, and I quote. Listen, if a man is called an expert, the first thing to be done is to establish the fact that he is such. One expert may be worth more than a million other witnesses that are not experts. Before a man has the right to speak about history and the language of the Old Testament and the Christian Church, has the right to demand that a man should establish his ability to do so. Now listen, for 45 years continuously since I left college, 45 years, I have devoted myself to the one great study of the Old Testament in all its languages, in all its archaeology, in all its translations, and as far as possible in everything bearing upon its text and history. I tell you this so that you may see why I can and, and do speak as an expert. I may add that the result of my 45 years of study of the Bible has led me all the time to a firmer faith that in the Old Testament we have a true historical account of the history of the Israelite people. Uh. And I have a right to commend this to some of those bright men and women who think that they can laugh at the old-time Christian and a believer in the Word of God. 
I have claimed to be an expert. Have I the right to do so? Well, when I was in the seminary, I used to read my New Testament in nine different languages. Hello, are you with me? Yeah. Nine different languages. So, ating hindi pa natin nababasa. I learned my Hebrew by heart so that I could recite it without the intermission of a syllable. As soon as I graduated from the seminary, I became a teacher of Hebrew for a year and then I went to Germany. When I got to Heidelberg, I made a decision. I decided and did it with prayer to consecrate my life to the study of the Old Testament. I was 25 then and I judged from the life of my ancestors that I should live to be 70. So that I should have 45 years to work. I divided the period into three parts. The first 15 years, so yung 45 years, yung sabi niya, ito yung edad ko, for 45 years, I will do my best to study the Old Testament. Ito yung ginawa niya. I will divide it into three parts. 15 years, I will devote to study the languages necessary. Languages, for 15 years. For another 15 years, I was going to devote myself to study the text of the Old Testament. And I reserved the last 15 years for the work of writing the results of my previous studies and investigations so as to give them to the world. And the Lord has enabled me to carry out that plan almost to a year. And you know what he said? We can be sure that the Old Testament that we are reading today is the exact Old Testament in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see? 45 years a guy, a, a scholar, gave his life devotedly to, to study all the necessary things about the Old Testament. The critics, the, 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 the truths, the facts, the available archaeological findings. For 45 years, this man is a genius. And he found out. Again, we have to believe the Bible by faith. But still, because it is, it is rational faith, it is true then you can find out in proofs that the Bible is real. And these people, these scholars found out that the Bible that we have right now are the very words of God. Amen? Amen. So, you can find the historical accuracy of the Bible. Wala pa yung archaeological, wala pa yung prophetic. mag pa natin next time, okay? I hope that we will learn more and more on how great this Bible is. Na kahit hindi nyo binabasa pa minsan-minsan at mas malala hindi natin sinusunod nasa sa atin ng libre ang makapangyarihan at perfectong salita ng Diyos. Amen? I hope and I pray that with this study, it would just lead us more because it's the Spirit that would really lead you. But it would lead you closer to a decision. Lord, I will read my Bible. I will devote my time studying your word. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Diba, pinag-aralan po namin nung nakaraan, just to read a portion, last time, just to read a portion of scripture before, in the time of William Tyndale, Ang isang magsasaka, his one day salary he will pay just to read a portion of the English New Testament. And now, yung ibang mga Bible, as a altar, puno na ng alikabok, ni hindi nakahawakan ng mga kamay ng Kristiyano. Okay? Tapos nakapasok pa sa technology at pwede nang ilagay at i-download. Pero iba pa rin. Ang gusto-gusto natin yung letter F, Yung kulipula na merong triangle. YouTube, ano ho? At saka yung binog na alamang lahat, si Google. Oo. Pero sana you have also the copy of the Bible in your phone and you can read it. When you're traveling, when you're going to work, when you're on the plane, it's available for us. Amen? The very words of God. Okay, to God be the glory. Let us all stand up, please, and let's pray for a while to prepare us for the preaching service.